All right. We are live. Mr. Brian O'Rourke, welcome to the Future of Fitness. Hi, Eric. Thanks for having me on. It's good to see you. Yeah, this is an absolute pleasure. I uh, I can't believe it's taken me six plus years to get you on the show. Um, you are uh, seemingly omnipresent throughout the industry. Uh, you know, I, I was joking with you. I think there's three of you. Um, you know, I always see your your name involved in something. You're speaking at some event. You have your podcast. You're, you know, now the CEO of Core uh, Health and Fitness. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's it's going to be a lot of fun talking to you. And I think um, you know, there's going to be some really interesting stuff. That we're going to get into. I was originally going to ask you about your backstory, and then you started telling me mm -hmm. about your backstory. I'm like, you know what? There's so much to it. I'm just going to let people read uh, your website, which is brianokorourke.com, and then we're going to get into, you know, um, a, maybe a better use of of your time on my podcast here. So, uh, you are a self described fundamentalist. I love that. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, you, you've seen some things you've worked in a, you know, number of different in industries, you know, scaled, um, great franchises and brands, uh, you know, outside of the industry, then kind of expose yourself to, to fitness. And it seems like, uh, you know, it's really become ingrained in, in your portfolio of businesses. Cause you say you have 14, right. And you're CEO yeah. of Gorn yeah. health and fitness. It's wild, man. It's wild. So anyway, um, let me start with this. When you say that you are a fundamentalist front within the industry, describe what that means. Well, to me, um, boy, that's a good question. Um, I guess that's a term I pulled out of my back end when we were talking. <laughs> I guess, I guess, what that means is that um, I'm a believer in fundamental principles, and I'm a believer in long ball. I'm not a believer in shortcuts, and I'm a believer in uh, in in uh, you know, kind of fundamental truths. So. You know, Charlie Munger just passed, God bless him. And I yeah. just did a post on LinkedIn because he was great at fundamental thinking. Uh, some of the things he would say, people would laugh uh, because uh, there was a lot of granules of, of timeless truth in his wisdom. And as you get a little older, I think you get less influenced by the latest shiny thing and you get more understanding about certain fundamental things that you need to pay attention to to really understand the world around you because a lot of people can get distracted by uh, uh, near-term uh, events and and think they represent things that might be uh, uh, more permanent than they actually are or they might be blown out of uh, proportion. You know, the AI thing going on right now, which I'm a big believer, I'm an early adopter of, of these technologies – a lot of that was going on back in the 80s at one time. I mean, I remember there was software and people were showing me things. So, you know, you, you, uh, you, know, you, you kind of start taking a, a perspective that's a little more long view as, as, as you age. So that's a long a way of, uh, of, of, of defining the term fundamentalist. Well, it, it makes a lot of sense to me because the, the longer you're in, I mean, just the longer you're on this planet, right? The more time you spend on this planet, the more revolutions, revolutions you do, the, you start to see the trends over time. You know, like if you just got into the fitness industry in 2019, you would think this yeah. is like the most dynamic, explosive yet, right. you know, like just incredibly exciting and, and really dynamic, right? But if you've yeah, been in it yeah. for, you know, prior, like I got into the industry around uh, 08. Right. So, yep. you know, so I, I saw some just a period of kind of slow growth, right. You know, yep. over that period of time, then everything just went wild. So, um, you know, that, that perspective makes a lot of sense, right. Cause I mean, gosh, let's just talk about the last four years, you know, 19 to 23, okay. like right. give us your insights on that. It's been wild, man. Yeah, it has been, I mean, many things going on, um, you know, and I could, I could opine on this for a long time. Um, but, um, you know, uh, obviously, one thing not as not maybe as dynamic, but you know, uh, budget model bricks and mortar space, which is a low price, uh, low operation delivery system, which mm -hmm. is really and for the most part is uh, taking people's money and hoping that they don't show up. Uh, at the same time, you've got you know technology, obviously, you know, becoming a bigger part of the conversation with some with the COVID uh, dynamic mixed in where. Companies went through a, uh, a a huge surge of, of valuation growth that didn't end up sticking. You have companies like Nautilus uh, that's now renamed Bowflex. They're barely hanging on. Everyone knows the Peloton story, let alone the many dozens of startups uh, that were 
uh, you know, coming at direct to consumer delivery systems that are all gone and, and many of them to come, you know, you know, what's happened with Tonal, Lululemon's deal with Mirror, I could, we could go on and on. Uh, and then you have the advent of, uh, you know, wearable devices that are getting more intelligent. Um, you know, these things that I have in my ears, uh, you know, um, app deployments and of course, AI and the new concepts of personalization of AIs. Um, uh, you have, I mean, there's just so much we could go on and on about it. Um, you know, the boutique models, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the streaming models content. I mean, it's just a plethora of things in the last five years. Do you feel, um, maybe put like a specific timestamp on this, like let's say, 1995 um when you look back to that period of time like how what was it then compared to now like what are the significant differences that you see uh in your experience yeah well so i got involved in health clubs uh well when i was working with smoothie king we were putting in uh we were putting kiosk in 24 uh, in 24 hour back in the houston market so I got exposed to it originally then um, and with uh, the guy I worked for before, Al Copeland, God rest his soul, and Papa's, he was very avid into fitness. So as a consumer, I, I was exposed to it, of course. And then working with the Francos uh, in the in the 97, 98, in that range, um, you know, it was far more mom and pop oriented uh, with, you know, a few exceptions, but it was far more mom and pop. Another dynamic that's real is on an inflation adjusted basis, average membership dues have been in free fall since the early 80s. You know, the, the price of a Honda back then in 84, 85 was about 4,500 bucks. Uh, the price of an average membership was about $38, $40. That's not changed much. Um, so you can see that there was no pricing power. Uh, you see the emergence of uh, franchise or corporately owned uh, low price models, which basically took the dynamics of getting people's money and not having many people show up with without much pricing power. The answer to gaining market share was to drop price, carve out costs, and build a marketing machine that could get you an average of eight to nine thousand members uh, with maybe two to three percent showing up on a regular basis, and you made a lot of money uh, doing that. Um, right. Uh, Mike Rondall, I had the pleasure of spending time with him years ago and watching all that unfold with Michael Scott Scudder and all this kind of thing. So a lot of economic dynamics also in that you look at 95, you know, the Internet was just starting to reach custom consumers. I mean, that's Netscape back then. And so, um, you know, we didn't have the technology we do today. I mean, um, and so what people are able to do with these devices, um, you know, this. Uh, the ability to have apps, um, you know, and free apps, you know, uh, that do so many things. Just to, there was nothing like anything like that at the time. So consumer experience, um, you know, was massively different, um, massively different. And we can get into modalities of training, of course, and how that's gone through trends, you know, the reemergence of strength. Back then it was far more cardio oriented. Generally, the idea of women weight training was not nearly as widely accepted. Um, you know, it's funny as well. You talk about 95. I've spoken about this quite a bit that uh, one of the greatest contributors to the growth of the bricks and mortar and fitness space in general was the invention of the birth control pill in the 60s. Yeah. And what, what that led to is the two earner household because women then started going to college. Um, you know, back then in the sixties, that wasn't the case. So you started having women putting off having children, or if they did, they had fewer of them. Divorces started rising in the seventies. And so women really became a big driver of, of the growth of the industry space and fitness because they had more choice in their life and what they could do. And they weren't as, you know, solely driven to having kids. And so that started changing a lot of dynamics in the industry space, which is why, you know, Ursa was started in what, 1983. That's when, you know, a lot of things started bubbling up there and it continues to 95. But I would say that and then on, but I think, you know, corporate, corporate is a big deal. Franchising is a growth model, which wasn't really as big of a deal back, 
in 95, you had a few players, but not like now. And uh, you, had a, you had a pretty narrow set of business models compared to what you had today, a much broader set of business models and a, many more channels of distribution of fitness services. So because of tech uh, and innovation in the space. So, and of course, you know, the numbers, um, you know, the, the, the industry's grown quite a bit. Um, you know, the UK having over 20% adoption and membership for facilities you have, you know, 50 million users of Noom as an app. You have, uh, you know, 100 million, more than 100 million users of Apple Watch in their health ecosystem. So you're, you're, you're dealing with, and in, in by our, our estimations through Fitness Industry Technology Council, there are over 1.5 million users of some type of fitness or health tracking device in the world today. So it's, it's that's significant in comparison to what's going on in 95. Wow. You know, the dual income household, uh, women entering the workplace is an interesting thing. I I can't remember if I read it or was in a documentary, but it's also how the modern food industry got Mm -hmm. got a foothold, right? It was Mm -hmm. like basically as simple as, well, who's going to cook dinner? The food industry is like, hey, we can sneak in here with easy meals, microwave meals, right? Um, Oven baked pizzas, stuff like that. And that's really kind of how it got a foothold, right? Because no one Mm -hmm. one want to work and come right. home and cook dinner and cook all the meals. So it was, it's really interesting how that fundamentally changed so many different industries and allowed these, you know, uh, gateways for for people to get into uh, people's households and lives. And look where we are now, right? Um, it's it's an enormous trend. Um, it is. You know, uh, let's let's focus on the present for a second. You you are now the CEO of uh, Core Health and Fitness, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, when I saw that news, my first reaction was, and this is actually the first time, well, second time you and I talked, I think in passing at one point. Um, but I was like, this guy is really busy. And I know we don't use that term busy full. I I don't like the term. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I discussed that plates full. Um, Productive. Productive. (laughs) Thank you. Yes. And now you're taking on a chief executive role officer, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned 14 companies that Mm-hmm. that you own or are a part of. Um, mm-hmm. So what drove you? What was so, uh, you know, attractive about this role with Core Health and Fitness that you decided to, to jump on as a, as a CEO operator? That's a multifaceted question. So number one is I've, I've advised uh, uh, the founder of the company, Mr. Bruno and his family on their business holdings for a very long time. I've known him for about 15 years. Um, and so I actually sat on the board of the company uh, for for a stretch, and was a, a principal architect behind the um, the uh, transaction that brought Gainline Capital Partners into the company about four years ago. So, um, you know, so I was, you know, I knew all the parties well. Um, I was a part of recruiting uh, uh, the chief financial officer and um, and. Uh, who now is also another guy who's the head of uh, of uh, global sales for the business. I know a number of players in the company. And, um, you know, the company has done a number of acquisitions. So, and I was involved in, in archetyping those acquisitions as well. So at some point, um, Mr. Bruno came to me and asked me to step in the role. And the reason why is, um, of course, I was very comfortable knowing all the players. Um, I had reached a point in my career where in my other business interests, I have partners that are quite adept at running day to day. Um, and so I think it's just a unique opportunity, 1700 employees, almost a quarter of a billion a year in revenue. Um, you know, when you think about, uh, how you can make an impact, this was a platform where I thought I could really take all of my time learning and experiences and help. Uh, the people here uh, make a bigger dent in the industry space. And so that's what made me really uh, pay attention when uh, Mr. Bruno brought up the opportunity to, for me to, to consider it. And we took some time working through uh, details and he's been very gracious. And that's a long answer. I hope that makes mm-hmm. sense, but that's why. And what specifically, um, you know, when change happens or, or you know, when someone is brought in, at the CEO level, that generally means change, right? Some change is desired. So if you could sum like, you know, with core health and fitness, like what are some of the major initiatives that you think made them, led them to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we, we want to put you in? 
Well, it's a platform that has, you know, done a number of acquisitions. Um, as I said, I know the people. Um, I think that, you know, like anything, when you're going to seek to scale the business further, uh, you have to add more layers of, of folks uh, on the team to try to coalesce everything to get better at what you got to do to make that happen. They have a lot of terrific uh, people in the business already. Um, and I, I take a very much of a service or servant leadership kind of, of uh, approach to the That's business. You know, a lot of, a lot of organizations, um, you know, are dealing with a lot of change, both externally and internally, how people do work, what is important versus what isn't. There are many dynamics today. Um, and you've read, you can read all the business journals, you know, especially when it comes to things like digital transformation of organizations, uh, the workforce itself, um, you know, especially post COVID. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot to consider there. Um, um, I think the organization was already going through change and uh, not speaking for Mr. Bruno or the board, but um, I think they didn't do it with a sense that anything was particularly wrong. They were looking at it as, we, you know, we need to continue to upgrade our talent uh, to help us get where we were going to go. So, um, uh, and, and I think that it just makes sense. I mean, we have, you can see these brands behind me. We have a, um, a series of iconic brands in the business. Um, uh, we serve, uh, you know, thousands of customers around the world. Um, we have a very broad uh, uh, network of dealers and distributors and fantastic uh, uh, customer base from core, I mean, from crunch to EOS. To, I mean, you know, globally, just 24-7 and many others. I'm leaving some out, but we are also in the vertical markets and doing a lot of things there. So it's exciting, um, you know, to work with a great group of people with a bunch of great brands and, uh, I'm just delighted at the opportunity to try to help. Yeah, right on. Great answer. Going into, so we're recording right here towards the tail end of, of 2023, which is remarkable to me how fast time goes. The uh, last three years, as we talked about, you know, um, very dynamic within the industry. And now we're, as we're going to 2024, I mean, I think the common outlook for next year is that there's going to be a lot of consolidation, right? There's going to be a lot of, um, you know, that, the, cons the trends on the consumer side, the personalization, and you know, I've talked about through technology, um, a lot of different things. But when we, when we talk about consolidation, I've talked to Bill Davis about this. I've talked to a couple other people on this show. Like, how do you see that? Let's dust off your crystal ball here, Brian. Um, you know, how do you see that playing out over the next few years? And what do you think is initially, you know, I have a hunch, but why do you think is driving that consolidation across the industry? Well, when you talk about consolidation, you're talking about delivery systems like fitness facilities themselves. I think acquisitions. Or, or are you? Yeah. Yeah, for fitness facilities. Yeah. Um, well, you know, first off, the acquisition marketplace is a lot more challenging right now than it has been. Um, and so while the, um, the driver of consolidation is there, and I can talk about what that is, um, what you're going to be dealing with in the market, and I think we've been dealing with it for a little while, is an expectation issue mm -hmm. because a lot of money was paid on valuations that don't mm -hmm. apply anymore. And so a lot of potential acquisitions have been stalled because uh, investors don't want to uh, take a taste of that poison pill of the bitter medicine that they're going to have to take um, uh, because their economics just don't make sense anymore. The, the drivers are obvious. I mean, it's a, uh, Basically, especially with the cost of new construction, which hopefully is waning, but you saw Planet Fitness's release where they talked about, you know, where we used to build five clubs, we can only build four, you know, and construction costs have gone up quite a bit, um, which is problematic, as well as other costs. So as profit margins get squeezed by certain operators that haven't reached enough scale, it's just basic economics. Uh, the bigger fish are going to be able to eat the little fish because... Uh, their scale enables them to, uh, you know, to uh, to consume those uh, uh, other players under a different economic scenario. So they're, you know, they can allocate their cost over a broader number of of units, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, those are just the fundamental, um, you know, components of being economic drivers uh, of the of the uh, M and A game in the space. And who do you think is uh, going to benefit the most? over the next year or two, if you had to take a, an educated guess? That's a good, good, good question. Um, 
Well, I think the uh, low price providers are going to be the ones that uh, are going to benefit the most. Um, you know, um, you know, Plan has already acquired some of its other operators uh, from the franchise side. Um, you know, you have a number of players that are in a kind of a growth spurt um, in in markets um, that will probably evaluate um, an exit strategy there because they're not quite big enough, uh, and they have to evaluate. You know, when when is the right time for them to realize a cash out? A lot of these um, other players that are emergent or maybe more regional, um, you know, they brought in private equity or private capital, you know, five years ago. And so they're all going to be looking at, okay, what's the cost of us sticking in and investing more versus what what can we get for the business? Now, I think most of that play is going to be in the low price market. Um, at the same time, there are other operators who are at the higher end that uh, – they're struggling, especially with uh, uh, metropolitan areas experiencing still office space occupancies that are well below what they used to be. So, you know, we, there are a number of these brands that are dealing with some dynamics that um, they're going to have to figure out that have higher costs. So um, I'm a big fan of Basic Fit out of, uh, out of Europe. I think they're probably uh, one of the better operators in the world. Um, I know that uh, their management doesn't necessarily uh, maybe think about growing um, in an unorganic way through M&A, but uh, I think if they wanted to do it, they could. Um, uh, the same uh, is true for a Pure out of the UK with Humphrey, uh, who's an outstanding uh, CEO. So you got some really smart people that are putting profit on the bottom line that, that are in that sector. They have a lot of options available to them. And um, I think as opportunities avail themselves, they're, they're going to evaluate and take advantage of. So I, I can see that being the predominant um, uh, arena for M and A in the coming year, uh, year to two. Awesome. What's uh, Brian? What's your opinion on the future of connected home fitness in that category? Yeah, I think it's going to be a category. Obviously, mm -hmm. I think um, I think it was highly. Um, uh, I think people thought it was going to be much larger than it became. I mean, I remember when I was at Cybeck um, in 2019, I gave up a keynote, and in there I reflected Peloton had just went public. I think it went public at a $29 share price. And and listen, nothing but respect for the product. I think there's a great product, et cetera. <clears throat> but that's a case study of where um, there's a detachment uh, from reality when you read their S1 that claimed that they were going to reach 75% of households in the United States with a household income of $100,000 or more. And we all know a couple things. Number one, there are fads that come and go in the space. We know that. I mean, look at Nautilus, which has changed its name to Bowflex. Um, that company you know, with Bowflex was a huge behemoth in consumer, direct to consumer. Uh, with their marketing engine, great success, and uh, now they're they're really struggling. Um, and I could, we could go on and on with these different examples, where you know it doesn't mean the business model of connected fitness doesn't work. It means the economics behind that at that scale don't work. There are too many alternatives. Um, you know, I, I train at home and I train at a gym. I do not have a Peloton, um, and it doesn't mean I've ridden them. Um, but uh, I have uh, dumbbells, bands, and, um, um, and that kind of thing. And I run and cycle. And then I'll go into a gym to do more serious weight training for a different experience. And uh, I think there are just more and more consumers for convenience that do a combination of these kind of things. So, you know, if you're going to count on a singular modality for a long time in a business, I think that's pretty risky uh, <laughs> because, you know, people, you know, as good of an experience at Peloton or others might be, after a while, you're going to want to do something a little different. And after a while, um, you know, the subscription model thing is going to get, you know, I, you, you start, well, I want something new now. Uh, I might, you know, and I, so I think that's just the nature of the beast. Um, I do think, though, that in connected fitness, the whole arena of what that means is going to change quite a bit in the coming years. Um, and, you know, Apple's not stupid. They, they made it very clear that they're getting in the health business. Other people are as well. And so these earphones I'm wearing, these device I have, and the death of the smartphone is upon us in the next decade or less. 
Um, you're you're going to see intelligent agents that are represent the most knowledgeable behavioralists and and advisors and experts on you that are going to be able to guide you in your life. You know, right now I get on a scale every morning. I know my body fat, fat percentage. I track my food. I know what my caloric burn is. I've got all that data. Uh, now, you know, te testing the, the stress in my voice, which is becoming a thing, uh, knowing to measure all of my biometrics and then taking that data, understanding my sleep patterns, understanding the variability of my heart, understand all these things and then coalescing that data in a meaningful way, understanding my psychology and having a, a humanized uh, kind of approach of helping me uh, with my health is going to become a mainstream thing. So the idea of connected fitness through kind of uh, singular content distribution is going to change. It's going to become far more um, personalized and far more um, in depth in its its ability to help us because we're humans. And a lot of the things we do are for a lot of reasons uh, that aren't just about, you know, running five miles or lifting weights. It's It's a holistic thing. And the more we understand it with data and the more we have personalized uh, uh, data through agents that can uh, talk to us in a voice that we find most appealing in a way that's the most effective, hopefully we can make these algorithms help our algorithm get better at being healthier. That was, uh, okay, there's a lot I want to unpack there, Brian. Um, you know, I, it's, it's interesting, like... I, I joke about this and it's kind of funny when you say it this way, but like we're in some ways we're already like cyborg organisms, right? Like we, we are integrating with technology, whether we are fully aware of it or not. Um, one of the things I want to unpack on that, because this is something I, I it's kind of a, a new, but you mentioned the death of the smartphone in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. T talk to me about that. What, what do you, what do you see? Yeah, well, right now, I my uh, watch here has a cellular device in it. Mm -hmm. I don't need to have my phone to make a call. It's all integrated here. I can listen to my podcast here. I don't need the phone now. I mean, I can talk to this, and it will dial whoever I tell it to without a phone. Um, and so what we're talking about is, to your point, it's like cyborg. The, the technology is going to become more embedded in everything. And so the thing about, you know, technology is the negativity behind smartphones, as great as they are, they're always, always distracting us. And because of the way we have to deal with that technology, it's just a natural evolution that the way that technology works is, is more integrated to our human selves. And so, you know, like my calendar or having to see every text that comes through and being notified, that's where intelligent agents are increasingly going to be. In integrated here. And, you know, right now I'm on focus mode. And so it knows not to let a call through unless it's an emergency. I, I will not get a text notification. And these are just the beginnings of, of, of balancing out, um, you know, the effectiveness of these tools and, and kind of trying to glean the negativity out of them and embed them even more so that they're like the air we breathe. We, we know it's there. But we don't when we're using it until it's not there, and then you can't breathe, and then you, you know, you're going to react to it. So technology is going to become more and more like the air we breathe. Wow, yeah, it's it's wild that when you think about it, the form function of a smartphone really hasn't changed since the iPhone launched in 2007, right? right? Uh, I mean, right. they've tried, you know, they've tried to do the the flip phone or the sandwich phone, whatever you want to call it, but like it just it's the same thing, right? It's just still a block. You're just folding yeah. it in half. Um, you know, yeah. I still miss the days of the actual flip phone. I know they're available now. <laughs> I actually almost yeah. bought one because I dropped my phone in, in the water when I was in Mexico. Um, I was like, God, how good would it be just to have an old fashioned flip phone? I'm like, ah, it's just not realistic anymore. Like, you know, I want to be able to have that <laughs> connection to, to email and things like that so I can travel effectively. Um, if you had to take a guess, and this is just fun, um, 10 years from now, what do you think the actual form function of the mo of, of the mobile devices we know it will be is it going to be a wristwatch is it going to be something else is it going to be like where, where where would you bet your money well the last i think you know basically the inter interfaces are going to be audio yeah. right um 
that then you know what they're trying to do with this. I mean, Vision. Yeah. You see, and I've talked about these in my talks, you know, so you see the, um, there's several technologies going on to put the contact lens in. I think that's a little further out. Mm-hmm. You see what's going on. So basically the screen thing, you're going to have screens. I think there's no doubt screens are going to get cheaper and cheaper. You know, the price of a hundred, a uh, hundred inch uh, uh, high definition television is now you can get these things for a, uh, like three to four grand now. I mean, they're coming down. And and so, but those, you know, as far as personal use goes, you could have that and that's fine. You could, you know, there probably will be some kind of device you can bring into the ecosystem like this, or you can put the glasses on or ultimately the contacts. And then as far as the device itself, I think, you know, uh, wrist is probably logical. Um, and then you have, of course, other sensor devices. So, you know, putting... Uh, you know, a tattoo device on you or, you know, even for people with uh, uh, monitoring their blood sugar, there's a lot of devices now and all those things just plug in and they interrelate. So it's really, you know, taste is even a dynamic Mm -hmm. that might perhaps start to emerge, but it's basically the senses, you know, it's touch and you see haptic now uh, with, uh, with Apple gesture. That's, that's a thing with the watch now. So, you could see interfacing with technology just through gesture, using hands, doing this. You see eyes, touch, ears, audible. Um, and that those, you know, again, like the air we breathe, it's going to be everywhere. And the, it's basically the configuration of that to, you know, collect data and deliver experience around that data. So uh, that's that's what I see happening. I think we're well on our way uh, to, to, to experiencing that. With Apple's release coming up with their new headset, it's really designed to replace the screen, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, it's a convenience thing and they don't really think people are going to walk around with these things on. They see these really as professionals using those things to replace the screen and all it's doing is embedding you even more into a digital world. Um, and I think that's logical. I think that's where it's going. As a, as a human being, how do you feel about that? Like our, our integration with technologies, it, are, you sound like obviously an optimist when it comes to, to technology, right? But what, like, do you have any reservations? Does do you have any? Um, yeah, like how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I think well, there's always going to be problems that emerge, and technology then emerges again to solve those sets of problems. Kevin Kelly talks about this in some of his talks. I'm a big fan of his. Um, and so, yeah, there are going to be some problems, just like when we invented the automobile and then car accidents came to be a thing that we didn't have to worry about before, um, you know, or pollution started occurring that we didn't have to worry about before. So then it's up to the next era of technology to fix those things. And then they're going to they're going to increase uh, cr- create unanticipated outcomes and there are going to be problems. I mean, we know that the use of, of social media with smartphones being the culprit uh, has really been a, a problem with uh, with people and their perception of their lives. You know, depression amongst teenage girls has risen significantly. There's been a, a writings on this. Uh, so for their for the good that comes from it, there's always going to be bad. We know about the algorithms uh, that and the consequences of those. Uh, and that's why with OpenAI, you know, which started out as a nonprofit, uh, it really its mission was to really be a steward of the technology because as you get more advanced, the consequences become less anticipated sometimes and they're more severe in their potential outcome, Uh, whether it's nuclear energy and uh, the atom bomb resulting in clean energy, ultimately with fusion. There's always a dark side we've got to navigate. Um, And and so, yeah, I mean, there there are going to be problems. There's no doubt. Hopefully um, humanity uh, becomes responsible because uh, these things are they are not retained by borders uh, and it requires uh, much more global cooperation to deal with these things and that's that's a challenge right now um, so I, i'm a realist i'm a fundamentalist in that sense but i'm also an optimist in the long run i think it's going to be okay i think the benefit you know of it is going to be substantial uh for for all of humanity but it's not going to be without its its uh, downsides yeah yeah, well said. And I think I'm close to where you are on it, uh, but I'm not quite yeah, yeah. sure it's going to be okay. And yeah, you know, that's I that's just that's fair. You know, that's just the way the conversations need to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I've kind of 
want to put into a larger category for our conversation here, Brian, is like, uh, you know, longevity, right, is is become a very mm-hmm. popular thing for so many reasons. Um, mm-hmm. This year, uh, overall health and wellness is is the trend, yep. right? Uh, yep. And I've always mm-hmm. seen one of the greatest opportunities we have as an industry when I talk about fitness and uh, overall is like, how do we get ourselves at the forefront of preventative healthcare, right? You know, the dream of like a doctor writing a prescription um, to go see your local fitness professional, right? And that's starting there. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people working on it, right? Um, True Med is out there. For a long time. Yeah, for a long time. A long time. Eric, it's, rock is a it's not going it's, it's to work. Okay. So tell us why. Yeah, it's not going to work. Well, in the United States, it's certainly not going to work because the sick care system is not about uh, preventative medicine. You don't make money. Uh, most of the realities behind this, and I've sat on the Medical Fitness Association's Education Committee. I've been to hundreds of medical fitness uh, facilities. Uh, even those are not really integrated uh, into a healthcare system because the bottom line is the, the sick care system does not make money keeping people well. Yeah. And neither is our insurance companies, which is the biggest racket going in the United States. Um, uh, insurance companies they had no value. Uh, if you if you look at the dynamic behind insurers, they they have no. The only reason you see some of these initiatives, in my opinion, is for marketing purposes and to keep the regulators at bay. Oh, we're giving away free, um, you know, watches to our our insurers in this population. Well, you know, some of that is. HMOs and Medicare uh, populations, and there's an economics there and how those people are, and they're competing for certain populations by providing what is essentially promotional stuff, but they're really not using that as a business model. You know, the idea that you're making money on that. And and if you go to, um, I did a podcast with Rick Mayo recently and talked a little bit about this, who's been on your show. Um, yeah, longevity is a thing. Quality health, quality health is a thing. But a model to really deliver on that is not really appeared yet. Now, I know there's some that are out there. You know, you see Lifetime doing some things. You see P- Peter Diamandis' uh, model. Uh, you know, it's $20,000 for the initial scan and the full-end blood work deal. Um, I myself has, have a concierge doctor that I can get on the phone. But none of these people are integrated in any way because there's no economic incentive to do so. So unless you're a person with a significant amount of personal discretionary income or wealth, uh, that doesn't exist. And the reason it doesn't exist is there are no incentives to make it work institutionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though all the economics there, there's no alignment. Um, you know, when United Health makes the amount of money it makes, it doesn't have to invest in this to keep making the money it makes because it's a sick care system. It's not a health care system. It's not a wellness prevention system because they can't make money on that. And so... I think, you know, I think there's a, a number of drivers that are going to make it be relevant for certain populations. But until it's kind of like higher education right now, the price of that is just outrageous for what it delivers for many. Um, but until some of these institutions break and fail, there is no impetus and the, uh, to change it. And the idea that we're going to influence public policy is another rose colored glass. <laughs> a rose-colored glasses uh, approach. Because when you look at policy in government in the United States right now, I think Amazon alone has almost 110 lobbyists on the Hill. Um, you, you just have entrenched players that have significant financial interest in continuing the status quo. So like a lot of institutions, as I've talked about in my speeches in the last few years, the number one commodity in the world right now is trust. Uh, people do not trust institutions for good reasons, uh, you know, because when they see their interests not being aligned with the institutions that are defined to supposedly help them, that's where the disconnect comes. And sadly, change doesn't often happen in a smooth and easy way. Mm-hmm. It's either, you know, it's usually through pain. And uh, until things start breaking uh, and people wake up, I don't know how we can institutionalize that change. There'll be, there'll be, you know, there'll be examples like me with my concierge doctor. Technology is going to evolve to do these things better. Um, and, you know, hopefully maybe people go, well, I'm not, I can't afford spending $20,000 a year on premiums with a $10,000 deductible. I better get my blood pressure under, under control because I'll be busted if, I'm, if I don't, you know. 
So, you know, these are the realities that I think eventually will lead to solutions. But in the near term, I'm not an optimist in seeing those things really work. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an interesting viewpoint. And, you know, one of the things I've, I've picked up so far in our conversation, Brian, is that uh, you do not sugarcoat, right? You just, you say it as it is. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's great. It's I very have an refreshing. opinion, but it, <laughs> it's very refreshing. Well, I don't, I'm often not right, but I'll tell you what I think. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, Although, although I got to, I got to say this, Eric, you know, I mean, I obviously I I'm, don't know everything. In other words, we'd be on my yacht in the Mediterranean somewhere, but, but, um, but I would say that, um, you know, when I was in Europe active talking years ago and I brought up the fact of, uh, of, uh, you know, artificial intelligence being a real thing, people laughed me off the stage, mm-hmm. literally. When, when, when I spoke about, uh, what was going to happen to Peloton, people just laughed at me. And so, Look, here's what I meant about being a fundamentalist, and believe me, I'm not always right. But generally speaking, there are there are truths that I think are fundamental, and um, you know, um, you you start to discern the difference between flash in the pans and the reality of what uh, is happening. You know, from an economic dynamic, from a demographic dynamic, from all these dynamics. And if you take a fifty thousand foot view and you read enough and you kind of have a sense of it. You can't predict perfectly, but over time, I think it gets easier to see um, of what some fundamental things are that 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 will tend to, you know, there'll be jig jags along the way. You can't foresee everything, but they will tend to play out. And um, and so I think that's just the way it is. Yeah, well said. What uh, what say you, Brian, about we we're talking about prior recording. Um, like lifetimes, you know, adoption of semaglutide brand name Ozempic, yeah. right? That's been all over yeah. conversations everywhere across the industry. And, you know, the, yeah. uh, unite, I think, I think we have a similar outlook on it, but the initial feedback was like, everyone was like, there is no magic pill. People are too lazy. This is mm. going to be terrible. Right. And I'm like, I don't know. I think, I think this is a good thing, right? It's a catalyst for change. And that's good for I, our I industry agree. because let's face it, we've done a shit job trying to get into, you know, the majority of the population for a long time. We've been talking about this, you know, 20%, 80% thing for a long, time. long time. I'm like, anything that can get us into that, you know, if we can push a little bit farther in, right, get a little bit of people who would never come into a gym otherwise in there, um, that's, I'm, I'm down for it. Let's give it a shot. Like, why not? Right. So what, what is yeah. your opinion so far of, of how that's rolling out? Well, I think it, it can, and not just this drug, I think there are a lot more things that are coming um, that can, because people don't go to gyms or facilities for fitness because they're intimidated. That's the number one thing. They, or they feel ashamed of themselves. I got to lose 10, 20 pounds before I even go work out because they're worried about the way they look and how they feel when they train, et cetera. You know, I mean, there's plenty of research and all this stuff. Everyone knows it. So no, I see it as a good thing. I think when people are struggling with their weight and uh, they're not healthy as a result and they take these medications. Now, and it's been widely proven uh, that if you strength train while you're doing this, you're going to have much better outcomes because you're going to lose less muscle fat. You're not going to be skinny fat. You're going to, you know, you're going to lo- retain much more of your lean uh, muscle mass, which is good in the long run for your metabolism, as you know. Um, in fact, Suzanne at, in Alloy, uh, Rick's partner, she, uh, I think they're doing a thing on that uh, this week, but talking about that. So there's a lot of using that therapy in the right ways, I think can do a lot of good and, and will, uh, you know, increase demand. The only challenge is that the price of the drug is very prohibitive right now. And, um, you know, but, you know, knock on wood over time, hopefully, uh, you know, we will see the a release of other medications and, uh, and maybe subsidies around it because of the economics of sick care. Well, I can't make money on you in the bariatric bed uh, doing what I got to do to get you, you know, to, to conduct uh, weight loss surgery or whatever other therapies that might be uh, delivered through sick care. But um, so maybe I can make it on the drug side instead. You know, so you, you what's interesting about that is you're using that same delivery system of sick care to help people get into preventative care. Um, and the jury will be out on how people manage that long term. I, th- I think it is interesting as a general commentary, though, uh, when people, you see people losing weight, uh, or you see people getting healthier. And I've actually witnessed this firsthand from people in the fitness space. Did you do that naturally? 
like it's some kind of shameful thing to take a therapy that helps people like like you're morally corrupt if you had just eaten right and worked out that kind of judgment um and and i'm the guy it's like look there's i've, I've also had some people uh, uh, one person i know in particular take the drug and had a very you know bad side effects from it so you know we got to be careful but at the same time look um therapies that deal with science it's uncovering more details of how the human body actually functions with its hormonal systems and you know how it processes blood sugar and all these things i mean this is this is our anatomy and um uh, you know thank god we had penicillin invented i mean it's no different really when you start thinking about it and i think we're on a kind of a we're going to be in a wave of these kind of therapies emerging over time to help people make the transition into a, a better uh, healthy preventative lifestyle yeah well said i mean it's funny when people say well it's not natural and i, I stop when people yeah. say i'm like look around like what about yeah, our exactly. current lifestyle is natural there's nothing yeah. about it like yeah, exactly. we're on our, constantly much. under technology i'm spending 97 percent of my day indoors like this isn't natural so like we got to yeah. look for unnatural ways to kind of counterbalance. I think it just makes a lot of sense. <laughs> right. I had, um, you know, I think this was a glimpse into why I'm optimistic about, you know, this, these programs that coincide with some of glutide is like I, uh, at my gym in the, you know, probably 2012, 2013 time I was working with post peri uh, bariatric surgery patients. And I could tell you, um, very motivated people, right. They had just lost a ton yeah. of weight. They knew nothing. Yeah about nutrition and exercise, right. but they were, they, they knew they had to do something. Otherwise the, all this time and energy right. that they would go back to where they were. So they were there, yeah. they were motivated. And these are people who had never been in the gym before. So that was yep. like a small glimpse into why I think this is a big deal. Um, and I'm, yep. I'm really optimistic about it. Um, I know, uh, I'm kind of butting up on, on your time here, Brian. Uh, yeah. What's, sure. uh, Gosh. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it. I could talk to you and ask you questions for a long time. So hopefully you'll agree to come back on next year at some point. Um, well, that's very kind of you. I'd be happy to join. You. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So I guess it, last question is, is how can we help you as an industry? What, what do you need um, assistance with? What do you mean exactly? Well, if you want people to reach out to you for specific things, like uh, you want oh, to hear sure, from them, sure, what, what would sure. you like to hear about? I'm pretty open. I mean, you go on LinkedIn. I'm pretty open. I'm on all the platforms. I'm, I'm very fortunate to to have uh, a lot of uh, followers in my network, and I follow a lot of folks too, like you. And uh, you know, I um, you know I um, I'm I'm pretty responsive, even with everything going on. So I'm more of a servant leader. So I don't ask for help as much as I give it. And so uh, uh, you know, um, of course, I'd love people to look at our products and all the companies sure. that, uh, and this one in particular, but, um, but no, I appreciate you asking, but, uh, it's really more about what I can do for the audience and you right on. Uh, and I presume LinkedIn is a good people, good place for uh, people to go. We want to connect with you. Yeah. Yeah. You can Google my name. There's plenty of platforms. LinkedIn's a good one. And, um, you know, um, you know, so just reach out. Awesome. And also, uh, Brian K O'Rourke is a dot com is a good place to go. And, um, Brian, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm going to let you go so you can continue uh, CEOing. Thanks, sir. And uh, yeah, it's been great. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian K. O'Rourke. Hey, thanks. And Eric, one last thing. I want to thank the 1,700 employees around the world at CORE for their warm welcome into working with the team and all of my other partners and friends in the industry space for all of our time and collaboration over the years and you for doing what you're doing. Keep up the good work. Right on. Love it.